Um, I'm Megan Lopez. I'm one of the uh, board members of Old Public Archaeology. Um, and um, I am um, hoping that we'll have our um, Old Pueblo program co-hosts come through. We were just talking about them, Martina Dowley and Annabelle, Gal Annabelle Galindo. Um, they're um, also sitting board members of Old Pueblo Archaeology and also Indigenous to um, this area and um, they, uh, they've they helped support us in bringing some awesome uh, panelists through come through and talk about their uh, specialty fields and the interests of um, the, the indigenous population. So um, again, thank you everybody for joining us. And uh, it's a great night. We have Jeffert here. Yay, Jeffert, thank you for joining us. And, you know, I really appreciate um, the time that you uh, spent working on um, this project with us and trying to get the, get the thing going. And so thank you for much, so much for joining us. Um, I do wanna, uh, acknowledge that uh, we have a land acknowledgement statement and I just want to read it off to some of the people who are joining us from out of state and people who are in state and um, haven't heard our land acknowledgement yet. So Old Public Archaeology Center ref uh, respectfully acknowledges that our nonprofit organization occupies and conducts our activities on land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes with Tucson being home to the Autumn and the Yaqui. Committed to diversity and inclusion, Old Pueblo strives to build sustainable relationships with uh, sovereign native nations and indigenous communities through education offerings, partnerships and community service. Um, this indigenous interest project that, that we're bringing to you this evening um, is a series of bi-monthly online programs um, or webinars in which members of the Arizona Indian tribes are given the opportunity to give presentations about their people's perspective, concerns, and interests in today's world, and um, how those viewpoints may or may not mesh with those of non-Indigenous peoples. Um, Arizona Humanities has provided Old Pueblo Archaeology with a grant to make these Indigenous interest programs possible. So um, during tonight's Zoom session, if you have questions, comments, as some of you are already doing, um, please uh, click on your Zoom chat or Q&A button and type your question or comment there and we'll, we'll read it at the end of the, of the presentation. And then if there's something you need to clarify, make sure that you put that in the feature. Um, use your hand, raising hand feature if you need to. Uh, if you have a question immediately, um, and as O Pueblo's program host, we will see all the chat and Q&A inquiries, entries, and we'll relay them as soon as possible. So um, in, let's see. So I've known Jeffrey for a really long time, just um, being community members and then working with, uh, with um, the Himdaki and working on a series of projects and trying to preserve the lands and also educate our youth. Um, that's something that we are parallel in and to have a strength in when addressing a lot of the, the things that happen on our community, in our community. So I really appreciate, again, I really appreciate you being here tonight, Jefford, and speaking on behalf of the of the, um, the autumn and our, our views, some of the viewpoints that you're gonna discuss tonight are strong, they're strongly held. I know like myself, I was uh, sharing earlier in the discussion with Al that um, I, I experienced a lot of the, the conversations with my elders and um, my relatives and, um, and just educators in general that um, there's there's certain things that you do and you don't do with artifacts and so you know a lot of what we're going to be understanding is the perspective of the autumn and the relationship between archaeology and archaeologists and what they do and so it's all it's all great information um, so um, without further ado Jeffrey please thank you I'd like to say good evening to everybody, all the people that are attending. And uh, 
hope you uh, enjoy what I'm going to talk about. I want to talk about myself first, of who I am and where I came from and where I'm going. Um, I grew up in the village of Tupawa, and uh, I, there's, I have uh, all of our kids, my brothers and sisters, there's eight of us. We had a big family. Um, and uh, we grew up not going anywhere, but living there in the village of Tupawa. It, you know, back then it cost money to travel, so we mostly just stayed home. But we also went and visited my, um, my grandfolks, and they were uh, pure uh, traditional autumn, always talking autumn. And when I went and I lived with them, I guess my mother uh, and my father decided to leave me there and uh, to, bet, to get better, better to know the autumn language. And um, I did. And I, and I spent a lot of time with them, my grandmother and my grandfather, my Bob and my who would have, that's my mother's uh, parents. And we went on trips and they always told me what to do and I listened to them and they took care of me. And then one day when I, um, when I was there with them, uh, this, this lady came and I, did, I, I had an idea, it was my mother. And um, he, she said that for me to, uh, to go, that, she was sent by my father to bring me back to my home. And I said, I told him, this is my home, at my grandfolks home. And I said, this is where I lived. They raised me, little did I know, not from childhood, but they raised me and they taught me a lot um, about the, some culture and a lot of work, was always work, working, chopping woods, go getting wood, feeding horses and um, doing a bunch of stuff. And, but one thing that really stuck to my mind was that my my grandmother and my grandfolks, we always, they always took me to a lot of my relatives and they would introduce me who I was to them, their grandson. And they, we talked all of them. And we went all over and she introduced them and to a lot of my, uh, my mother's cousins who in another village of uh, Big Fields. And today I think about that, that that was very important so the people would know who I am and where I, where I, where I live and my parents, my mother, and my father. And so, um, and I came back to here and, and I didn't feel, I didn't feel com comfortable because I spoke all the time and my brothers and sisters didn't. They did very little, but eventually I broke away and learned English. And, and then when I also remember my, my, my grandfolks on my dad's side, my wask and my cock, my cock was my, grandmother on my dad's side was uh, my mother's, my father's uh, mother, she was blind. And, and how she got there was that back in the old days, you know, the, the kids were forced to go to school and she got sent to Shalako over in Oklahoma. And um, along the way, and she cried and cried and cried and she wanted to come home, but they won't let her come home. So um, she stayed there and over the years when she did came home, she went blind and she went and saw her medicine man. And the medicine man said that the reason she got blind is because when she left to Oklahoma, it was cold and it got, and it, that's how it damaged her eyes. So every time I used to, um, I, I would go see uh, my, my grandfolks and my wasp, my dad's father was always singing, humming. He was a tall, skinny guy and uh, he also, did a lot of work and they had a fields and those fields are there and more a lot of trees they farmed a lot and I got to know my aunts and my uncles we didn't go visit them they would come visit us and we stayed there and and we grew up and my my mother and my father both worked and uh, they both passed on now and um and all of my other siblings they all got jobs and they all have grandkids except one of them and I have a grandson, and his name is Kingston. And he's, he comes and visits us a lot. And we're trying to teach him the language. And my, my wife always, uh, Amelia, she always uh, teaches him. She's teaching him how to dance. And he's learning, as long as you don't laugh at him. And he'll dance, and he's really, uh, move, you know, wants to do stuff. And I say, Grandpa, let's go over here. Let's go over there, Grandpa. Let's go over there. We'll go to my brother's house and you play with the kids, come back. And then I go do something, dig a hole or chop wood or something. Let me help. Let me help. And, you know, that's what kids need is that guidance 
of, of the basic work, to work, always work, because our ancestors, that's what they did a long time ago, always working and working, kept them in shape, running, uh, traditional running, the ladies would run every morning, my mother used to say, and, uh, and when she showed me where they ran, it was like about 10 miles. And the reason they ran was because they never knew when the Apaches would attack. So they had to be ready and get up and take off, run to the hills or run wherever they, they gather again. And that's why they were running. But they would bless themselves. And they, at, that, at that time they ran, they had skirts. And I told her skirts, she said, that's the way we were dressed all the time. But I lived there with my, and I, and back in Tupawa, where I finally got graduated from high school in Babakiri in, uh, in the community of Sals, the capital of the, 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 our nation. And I uh, graduated and I um, wondered what I was going to do. I said, well, and I had a friend, he, he's passed on now. And my friend said, well, let's go join the service. He said, okay. And so we ended up joining the Marine Corps. And uh, from my experience, I learned a lot from the Marine Corps. I learned a lot about the uh, discipline, leadership, respect, and met a lot of culture, uh, other cultures there, a lot of, not too many Indians, but uh, they were there, but we all had our little groups. And um, from my, all my stuff from the service, I really enjoyed, I liked it. It was a home away from home. Uh, but I was, first year I was stationed in camp, you know, Camp Swab, Okinawa. Man, it was really nice. To me, we lived right by the beach. Our barracks were there, a lot of exercise and a lot of training. From there, I came, uh, uh, I came back to the Camp Palatin. I was stationed at uh, Camp Horno, and I was there doing the same thing. Well, we would get deployed well, to the navies, and we'd go on deployment and uh, be on standby for any engines, anything goes goes on, as the president would send the Marines always the first, and we were always the first ones to land the ground and hit the beach and do what we're gonna do. And um, I, I stayed there for about two years. And then I said, oh, I wanna move somewhere else. And there was an opening for um, Okinawa, uh, for uh, Hawaii. So I signed up and said, get ready to pack your stuff and ready to go. So off I went to Hawaii and it was beautiful. I stamped it. The base I was was at Kenny Oe Marine Corps Air Station. That was the first uh, place where the Japanese attacked in uh, when they attacked Pearl Harbor, and we got to see a lot of the a lot of the mounds and well the places that happened right there. And it was it was really like history, and I enjoyed it. You know, I said, "Wow, you know, you hear about the attack back then? I'm actually there." You know, and then I got to see the island, uh, the Hawaii, uh, Honolulu, and the uh, Diamond Head, and I got to go to the West End, see the, the, the Hawaiian people there, their culture, it was really good. And I, was, I stayed there for uh, three years, and I, I got to travel. <laughs> so like I said, we're on deployment all the time, um, um, every battalion. And so um, um, our turn came up. Every, for the last three, every year we had to go on a deployment with the Navy. So I got to go to, um, um, starting from um, Aust uh, Australia, and then um, went to, no, New Zealand, Australia, Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, Midway, um, Tinian Islands, and then all the way up to uh, Japan, Mount Fuji, uh, Tokyo. So I got to tr travel and it was, you know, it's always uh, uh, Philippines, got to see other cultures, other cities. And when I joined up the service, I was only 17 and my father was really proud of me to uh, join the service. And, uh, and uh, when I went in, I had to sign for me, of course, I was still uh, 17. And I stayed there for uh, uh, three years and my term was coming up. And uh, by then a lot of people were leaving, they were not re-listing. Um, I told my drilling, my um, uh, uh, platoon captain that I, I didn't want to re-enlist. Everybody got upset, but it was okay. It was a time for me to leave. And so I left and I came back and I, looking for a job and, and uh, there was this young, there was this lady that um, said they need a park manager. And he was right in my backyard, the Babakiri Mountains at Ethoy Cave, Ethoy uh, home site. And, um, and, and I really enjoyed that. I got to walk around all over the Babakiri Mountain, 
see a lot of wildlife, a lot of plants. And I also got to see a lot of archeological stuff that was there in, at the Baba Curie Mountains. Um, crystal, crystals, uh, potsherds, grinding stone, matatis, manos, um, um, arrowheads, you name it. And a lot of pictographs on the rock, plant, rock, rock drawings. I got to see that and I was wondering, you know, who, who did this thing? But it, brought, it took me back to my childhood. My, my, uh, my mother, our mother was our teacher. And she taught us about she told us told us about stories, about the hobo crowd. And one of the time one of the stories that she had mentioned was the hobo uh, hog ox, the lady that was eating the people. And that's another very long story. And in autumn culture, we don't talk about stories in the summertime until it's winter. Then we talk about those stories. But um, she was our teacher, and and she she talked to told us about the hog ox, and we we're Eight of us were all gathered around her and we were so curious. What was this? And she told us and the good stuff and the bad stuff. And he stuck to my mind ever since. And, and he brought me back to Papa Kiri. And I, uh, I don't know, a lot of you guys have gone there already, but the, the picture rock has a lot of uh, picture graphs on there. And there's caves that have drawings on there too. There's a lot of stuff that's going on and you hear different noises. And, but when I lived there, I enjoyed it. I used to hike to Baba Kiwi and just sit there and wonder about that. Our, our ancestors used to sit there and probably prayed and um, asking for thanks and guidance in our, in our lives. And um, they probably left offering at Baba Kiwi. It's anywhere you go around Tucson, Mexico, down to Cells, Covered Wells, all the way down to Hill, um, not to Hikiwan, you can see Baba Kiwi. And we call Baba Kiri the center of our universe. It's the center of the universe. That's our belief. And I today I still believe that. And, and one of the other things that stuck to my mind was that my mother always used to say, you know, Ethoi, our creator, is not dead, he's still around. Because we never hear, oh, Ethoi is buried over there. So I believe that he's still here and we ask, we ask for guidance in our lives and protection. And uh, it helps us. And so when I, I, I lived there, and then I was there for like seven years, and then along came this young lady by the name of Donna Howe. She's a, she's a, a biologist. And she, we started talking. And um, by then, my time was up, and my, my position was they're going to do away with it. By then, I just had my first son. His name was uh, Travis. And I told, they wanted me to stay on. I said, no, I got a son. I got to get a job. So Donna Howe said, I want you to come work for our organization. And, um, and I said, okay. And that was the Arizona uh, Nature Conservancy. So I went and I started working and I was a uh, consulting to the tribe. And the thing that I did there was talk about endangered species. And we have a lot here on the reservation. Uh, Nichols Turks had cactus, uh, the Kearney Blue Star, bunch of some other ones too that we have. And so I went and I enjoyed it. And I finally got to come, really start going out to the other communities in other districts, which I didn't know I was not familiar with it because like, I grew up mostly at home. And then they would, they would uh, talk to me about this, about the plants and the animals, but they weren't really open. They would, I guess, see if I was true, if I was really an honest guy and talking about, knew what I was talking about. And so I learned a lot from uh, uh, my supervisor while I was in, with that organization. And, uh, and I liked it. I got to see all the others, like they have a lot of preserves. Uh, and I went and see them and I saw the, the manager there. And they told me we talked about their land, what was going on. And, uh, and they do have archeology span sites there too, which they protect. Now. And that was ah, in the eighties, you know. So I stayed there for, and and I worked, uh, worked there and I enjoyed it. The only thing is that I had to travel a lot of time, uh, Denver and other places uh, to, to talk about uh, uh, species that also on the Town Autumn Reservation, but along also that other tribes have uh, important plants as well and animals as well. So I did that one. And then um, it got to a point where um, 
I met another friend and uh, his name was uh, Peter Ruiz. And uh, he's passed on now, but he was interested in it. And he invited me to his office and I told, and I started when, and he started, we started talking, he started, we started talking. And he said, I heard that you were working over there and you're talking about this and uh, we want you to, would you want to come work for the tribe? And I, and I said, yes, I, I would very much want to come home and work because I've been traveling a lot away from my family and I want to just be right here. So over time, I, um, I, I got the job. I was a, a coach, uh, not a, a like, kind of like a biologist, but a field tech guy. Oh, ran all, I ran all over the reservation. And then I learned a lot of the roles, the back roles, the minings. Oh, then they talked about bats, snakes, you name it. Uh, went up to Baba Kiri, hiked around Baba Kiri, and then uh, worked with other biologists off the reservation. And uh, one of them was on the reservation, but did some a few stuff there. And then I uh, um, I was there, and I uh, it was uh, really interesting. I wanted to other people to know what they what we have in our backyard at Baba Kiri in their communities, and what plants were available, what they can uh, what they can use, and what's plant <laughs> toxic that, um, that 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 I know about it too. So I stayed there for about, oh, about eight years. Then I left and I went to work for my community, uh, working with the elderly, talking about culture, talking about the plants and the animals as well. And I liked that one. I stayed there for three years. Then we, I got out. I thought, oh, well, I'm going to go and uh, you know, take a break and then look for another job. And then uh, this guy came around. <laughs> His name Peter Steer, which is my supervisor today. And I started in 2011, and um, and he knew that I was a surveyor, and that uh, in, in, in I was also doing a, a cultural survey when I was working for the wildlife program here on the tribe, and got to see a lot of stuff. We have a lot of sites here on the reservation, all over, and some some sites that people don't know about, and where they're located, and we don't share that stuff with uh, in the outside world, and uh, that a lot of the uh, when I got to know people, they would take me out and they would show me that, that this was so there. Uh, this is what's on the rocks. This is what's in the ground. And some of them I didn't even know. And that uh, I go there to this today and I learn about this stuff. And I ask and I tell them, they, and they tell me it's uh, our ancestors, uh, the Hohokam, which a lot of um, uh, uh, archaeologists don't, don't understand that uh, we're the descendants. And he said, it's a separate, um, that just the word hohoka means it's all gone. It's not really their name. It was given to them, but that, that's our ancestors because they, they, they're, those people are us who we are. We use the same thing that they were using. We were farming, hunters, ceremony. But back then they had ball courts and they had um, um, platform mounds, all this stuff. And, uh, but our beliefs is that is um, our belief is what our people tell us, our grandfolks, my grandfolks, my parents, my mother, my father. And then I share that with everybody. Everywhere I go, I start talking and somebody will stop me and say, hey, what's this about? What's this about? The other part that, you know, in, and I'm going to kind of skip about, jump into archaeology. You know, there's good archaeology and there's bad archaeology. But you know, the all of them, um, you can't change our minds. Our minds can't change, won't change. And we believe what our ancestors told us, our grand folks, our, our parents. And those are the people that um, tell us, this is what that's about. That's what I said, okay. And then the archeologists, oh, no, 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 that's different. That's, um, is, um, this is what happened, this is what happens. Well, that's their belief. But you gotta respect of our belief of what we're, what we were told, and uh, we can't tell you a lot about what we what we know about it because it's only for the uh, the autumn people. And today, I I still meet people, my own people, at autumn, and they tell me stuff. Hey, you know, there's this over there, this that over there. Can you come see? And by the time I uh, to meet that person, he has passed on. And the bad thing is sometimes a lot of isn't today is not passed on to where, like I said, by my, our grand folks and our parents, and it, it needs to continue. 
and I, I have a grandson and I teach, talk to him. I haven't got to that yet. He's still a young kid. He's still running around, and which is good, but I, I, he likes to work. They all say, can I help? Can I help? And I say, yes. And I show him what I help. And that's what these kids need, that guidance. But, um, and so, uh, and then, but you know, without archeologists, we won't have all these reports. And we have a lot of sites here. One of them is called Jack Rabbit Ruins, big site. I've been to all these sites. The other one is Vashnik down in Vamri. That's another site, huge site too. And when I go there, and these sites were, uh, were surveyed by uh, Emory Howe, Julius Hayden, and um, there's, uh, there's a Scanley, and there's another one about uh, the sites that we know. And everybody's familiar with Emory Howe with the uh, Ventenative. And I read his book, and I went and I saw all those places where he started about, there was this place called Mesquite Root, Kuitatsk. Uh, and I went to that site and I looked around and I said, well, these people were here in the 60s and I'm standing on this ground and I see the artifacts that these are of them that were buried. That was the last place that Apaches attacked us in that village. And I talked to other people's cousins and they said they went back there in the 60s and they saw more artifacts. But a lot of it eroded away and, um, and um, some of it's still there, some of it I saw in there. And then I saw the fields, uh, some of the big fields that they were farming. And there used to be a, a spring there. And that's where they were getting their water. So Emory Howard taught talk us a lot. He also talks about Snake Town. That's another place, real interesting place to see that too. And then the other one is called uh, Vashnik. Vashnik is, is, they were trying to say wash and it, there's a Vamri wash and there's a big wash and people were farming along there. And I got to see what they were, what why they were there farming. And when they were surveyed in the 60s around somewhere around there, uh, one, of my, uh, one of my uncles is from a, another community, Chuli. His, his, uh, his last name was Harvey. And he was, uh, he was the supervisor, of the, I guess the, the supervisor for the autumn they were doing the excavation. So that autumn, those autumn got to see what the, Archaeologist was telling what they're seeing, and this is what happened, which was uh, which was good, and I think they were curious as well too. And then we also have up in uh, Baba Kiri, um, uh, when I was working there, and we used to talk to go to this one place. It's called Picture Rock. We never knew what was the name of it in uh, in, in Alta, but there was a lot of pictographs and there and then uh, talking to people about the importance about those sites. Today they're still there. And people, some people come there, but some people that are really interested in the culture, they'll go there and they'll pray and they get blessed from there. And they also go to our creator, Itoi Cave, which is another, it's a sacred place. And uh, we'll get into sacred places later. But uh, I got to see a lot of these places. And there's more, I know there's more caves there too. I had an uncle and uh, he passed away a long time. And they would come uh, with his wife and, they would come and talk to me about, oh, this is going, this is over there. Do you know that's over there? That's over there. And I said, no, I don't, but one day we'll go visit. And we never got there. Um, they passed on. And so to this day, I don't know uh, what the sites are, but I ran into some of the young ranchers and they know, seemed to know what he was talking about. But they never said, let's go over there. So it's fine with me, as long as they share that information and pass it on. To the younger generation, so they'll know and respect that place, in, uh, as well as the um, uh, up in Babakuri, there's a lot of artifacts all over, and there are some sites that um, I didn't know there were sites. And then, uh, well, maybe 20 years ago, when I finally found out that that was there, and uh, and I used to just drive by, never thought about it. And but we learn, we learn these things from sharing, and some people don't like to share, but it's okay. I just tell them, share with somebody, a cousin or brother or sister, and let them, uh, and they'll carry it on, carry it on. Eventually I'll find out, but not today. So, but it's fine, it's fine. I have other places I can visit too. So, so I, I today, I, I, I've been here since, like I said, 2011. And um, now I'll kind of um, um, uh, get out of, get out of, get out of my introduction about myself. But before I forget, I wanted to mention one, about my grandmother, 
um, her name, uh, Anne, her, my, my cock. And I used to go see her before I go to, go to go, go back to Hawaii. And she was always sad to see me go because uh, she had a son that was killed in Vietnam. And she was always so, I think she did that because that I might not come home. But when I came home and I told her that I was home for good, and she was all glad about that. And, um, but uh, she passed on too, and she was, uh, she used to talk about stories. And she, um, she I, I, you know, I loved all my grandfolks very much. Too. Okay. So I, now I want to go into, um, into the, some of the laws that we, uh, the, the, the tribe, mostly uh, uh, all the tribes in the reservation and what laws that we, 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 we have to abide by here. But one of the first one I want to talk about is the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. The reason uh, I was told that was established was back in the long time ago, there was a lot of loot, looting up at uh, North, Cor North, Four, North uh, Four Corners. And so they had to come up with this law to protect some of that, um, those artifacts, people that were selling, people that were uh, digging them up, and people that were taking them away. And uh, back then, you know, people were not, were, uh, we didn't have money. We were real poor, the tribes up there. And some of them had to give, sell them to buy, to buy, get money to put food on the table. And I can see that. But the other ones, they were using the bad way, which is not good. But that act was there and um, is still there today. And I'm not very familiar with them, a lot of these um, laws, but I, I, I understand what they were in the purpose. And so the other one that I kind of want to, want to, wanted to mention was about, uh, um, what's it called? Uh, it's called ARPA. It's called the Archaeology Resource Protection Act. Now that's one of the things that we deal with here. Uh, a lot of people that are collecting, or either that's um, or uh, looting. Well, looting, looting, and, and uh, we've had a case uh, years ago in our work. And uh, we uh, there was a, uh, a mine, a mine, uh, a mine that they had a caretaker, and um, he was uh, burning. Uh, he was getting rid of a lot of endangered species. Uh, in day one, endangered species, and he was uh, in, um, and the guy, um, the owner, uh, did a lot of damage to vegetation, and so ARPA was involved in that. And at the end of the make the story short was that he got prosecuted in federal law. Uh, I was put on the stand on the stand as a witness, did my side, and the guy had to um, had to uh, give up the land and had to pay some money back. And uh, he didn't go to jail, but he, he was, uh, he was uh, told to, the land needs to go back to the tribe. And he did. And we have it today. And now the plant, the, the small mine site is being protected. And there's, uh, we have a ranger that patrol the area. And there used to be a guy, a caretaker there, and he was told to leave and left. But uh, and that was one of the other places that I got to see one of the endangered species there. The Nikos Turks had cactus, and, uh, and uh, I always wonder what it was in autumn, but I never got to find out. All the surveys we did, I didn't know. And maybe there was probably a name for it, but again, it wasn't shared and it wasn't passed on. And I'm from another whole area of the rest, and the local, the one, the autumn that we're living there, um, probably passed on with that name. And, so we don't know. We just know it as is is English English um, name for it too. But uh, other cases that happen, you know, that's uh, that law is really powerful because anytime you get federal monies, all these laws apply there. So we have to buy it as well as the tribe, you know, and uh, and it helps us. It helps us protect our land here on the on the nation as well as all the other tribes. In Arizona and the United States, we use those laws. So the next one I wanted to talk about was the NAGPRA. Everybody's familiar with the NAGPRA, Native American Grave Protection and Repatriation Act of 1990. Well, to, uh, what I was told was that um, way before NAGPRA, uh, the Autumn Nation, we were doing reburials. And, you know, I'm pretty sure a lot of the people know about Liberius, but uh, we had to create 
uh, uh, reburial. And he was, we were doing that way before the law. And our good friend, Joe Joaquin, which he passed on, he was one of them that was in that, in that group uh, developing this NACPRO along with other tribes across the state, across the nation, and the state, everybody was pushing for that. And it applied a lot of it to the colleges and the universities to inventory their, their what they have on the shelves of human remains, funeral objects, and return them back to the tribes. And that's a process that goes on. And um, today, uh, uh, we are working on our reburials and we don't have it in about another two, another about another week we'll have it. And this is where NAGPRA applies, which is really good because we get large amounts of uh, our, our ancestors that have been on shelves for years and decades and decades. Well, it's time to return them home. And I like to say is that, you know, what I'm seeing now today is that a lot of these, um, uh, back in the old days, the archaeologists back then did not want to return those. They wanted it on shelves to be studied, studied, studied. But but this we didn't want them to do that. We want our assets to be returned. And so when we get them back, we have to create, we have to create this uh, ceremony. And uh, in about a week we will be going through that. And uh, we have our own site, but uh, it can't be given out because it's only for the autumn for Native Americans to attend those ceremonies. Nobody else can attend to it. So, so we're, it's a busy thing, but we're glad that NACPRA is helping us to get our, our ancestors back. We get them from all over. Uh, I have a co-worker, Samuel Payant, and he retreat, he just came, came, not too long ago, he came back from his uh, Smithsonian in, uh, in Washington, and he retrieved a lot. Uh, we get our ceremony materials and, and return them to the district and to the village that, that, was, that was there, that was collected a long time ago. And it's uh, returned now and the people probably feel the whole lot better. And that um, the last ceremony was in, uh, the week that was in 1940, 42, around there. And um, there was an article that uh, Julius Hayden had written and he was talking about that when he was invited, back then a lot of um, the, I'm going to say the white people were uh, autumn with environment. They were welcomed by the people there. Excuse me, <coughs> were uh, welcomed there to see what the ceremony was about. And one of the things that Julius Hayne had recognized is that the dancers were all um, old people, old men, because the ceremony is usually run by the men only. <coughs> There's no women involved. Uh, and, but there was, there was a part of it that was in the background. And he noticed that by then, this um, what started happening was there was boarding school. Kids were sent away to force to go away to other states, uh, institutions, and boarding school. My sisters and brother, my uh, three of my sisters went to boarding school, and um, and also that was going on. So Vietnam started by then, so a lot of them got drafted. A lot of them went, uh, went, there was another thing that came up was called relocation. It happened all over and uh, my tribe was affected by that too. And they were sent to California. Uh, my grand folk on my dad's side, uh, grandmother's side, she went to California. A lot of them left. And then uh, intermarriage from boarding school or wherever. And they went to their wives or boyfriends uh, tribe. And uh, to this day, it's still going on, but not forced. A lot of boarding schools are people, are, uh, the students are willing to go. And um, all of this was starting to kick in. And that's why uh, I think that the boarding, uh, the ceremony faded out. And today, a lot of people want to bring them back, bring the Rikita back and uh, our ceremony, which is really good. It was for the refreshing, like the New Year's, the vegetation, the, the paisage that we ate, um, and the chori, and uh, the, some of the stuff that we planted, like gaisa, corn, uh, corn, and uh, mostly squash, beans. And a, and a lot of the new crops were brought by Spanish when they started to come, the cattle by then, and horses, and we adopted a lot. So over time, we started to change. We had to change in order to, to, um, to uh, eat 
to buy, uh, to get, uh, to plant our crops and, uh, and uh, to survive. And so um, when, um, what was it? And so that kind of went on, that went on, kind of losing my thought. But Nagpa, getting back to Nagpa, that was a, a, a big thing for uh, a lot of the tribal members and that, uh, that, that act went to place. And we know, oh, I know what I forgot, was that um, what I'm seeing today is there's a lot of young ladies in archeology span and a lot of the young guys too. And one of the things I'm noticing is that what I hear is that they want to do the right thing. Let's give those remains back to, our, to the people that it belongs to. So we have to go through this process, through these documents to prove that, is, that that was our ancestors that were uh, tied in with them. And we do, and we get our remains. And so that's how our rebarious, that we get a lot of them. And we have a location where we collect them at every end of the year, we, we do our rebarious. So it's, it, 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 in a way, it, it is good. It's good, some law. But that's, uh, that's some of the laws that I wanted to kind of talk about and what, 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 uh, what I learned from them. And there's a lot of laws. In it too. So now I want to go, what I want to jump into is uh, the whole, um, and I kind of touched it on already, is that, you know, those are, those are who the autumn are. And um, our first name was Tapicals, and they were named were named by the by the Spanish bean eaters. I guess we like to eat beans. So not in the 80s when we changed their name to the Tono Autumn, the Desert People, and that's who we are today. And I would doubt it in the future we will change it again. As time again we're going to change. And uh, and, and like I said about Nagpa, but we're getting our ancestors back. The Hohoka. And there's a lot of sites on the rest that we have our ancestors there too. And we came from the river, got moved away from the river and we moved to expand it. So when the Spanish came, they came to some of the villages and there was nobody there. The reason they weren't there was they out, they left to go, to, to go harvest uh, bear grass for baskets or go harvest uh, by touch and go, they went to do other stuff. And the Spanish thought that they were nobody, nobody lives there, though they call it abandoned village. But it wasn't, but eventually they came back. Um, my mother uh, was telling me in, uh, that uh, in her village of San Miguel, uh, she, uh, they used to live up in the, in the mountains. Uh, and I went to the site and they had to carry water about a mile away to drink water and wash it. And, uh, and that was their winter home and they would stay there. And she had a lot of brothers, she had brothers that were, they lived off of wild plants and they also did a lot of hunting. And they also went to the, into Mexico and bought, bought stuff that they, they like cheese and other stuff like that they would buy. And in my father's side, there was another place, um, it was called Pitoica. And it's still there to the village uh, today, but it was shared with other communities. And that village is, um, I would go there and they have a lot of water, uh, spring spring waters, but uh, mostly dry all the time, only when it rains. And uh, that's where they lived, uh, my grand folks, and, and they would come down where I live in Tupawa in the monsoon to to uh, to plant Usha, Usha, the squash and the melons and the corn and the beans and the tepary bean. And uh, they would talk about, I had a grandmother her name was Annie Hubbard. She was married to uh, Navajo. And she, when I was small, when I, used, when I came back to, to Pawa, um, she used to, uh, I used to go help her at her house, chop wood. And she'd talk about what they planted, a lot of planting that squash. And she would say, oh, the corn was so tall. The squash were so big. And, but eventually she came back and lived there next to us in our in our, in our, in our, where we lived. And my father had a garden and he grew squash. So we grew up squash. And my father was a hunter and we always went hunting in the winter. We always hunted what tail deer. And they were up high in the mountains, but we climbed a lot, a lot of exercise. And we always had meat on there and we had javelina as well. And we ate a lot of rabbit. And, uh, but that's what we ate and plus to our stuff that we had too. So I got to grow up on, got to see a lot of uh, 
a lot of, you know, always being taught a lot of stuff. As long as my brother and my and my other brother, I have two brothers. And, um, but the whole uh, of all the stuff that I read from archeologists, they talk about that, about our ancestors. And, and I hear their side of the story, but we have our own stories about how we got here and how our creator brought us here, and how Ito made us, and how we had all these conflicts going on with uh, raised by the Apaches and old villages that are go there, you go there today, there's nothing there. But with the trained eye of an archaeologist or a monitor or a surveyor, we get we know what we're looking for and we'll see them and we'll tell people, this is the site. They say, well, how do you know? Say, come here. And we part we tell them what do we see? We see a potter pot shirt. Uh, obsidian, uh, manos, and uh, 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 a lot of other stuff, uh, decorated pictures, plain wear, all the stuff that archaeologists uh, enjoy looking at. It. And, uh, and, and some of those villages, there were hundreds of people there, but they moved. They moved to other villages, intermarriage, relation, they left for water, whatever else there was. But our, our, our creator, that put us here is uh, Ito, like I had said, but the whole come, uh, I think is the same thing. They believed in Ito, but it was just a different way of, uh, a different approach to Ito. And that's how they, they, they know about it. And they worship and every day, every day they worship what, what I, uh, the way I understand the praising that they, that they get to see another day and they, they're happy about the weather. I used to know I used to know a guy his name was Ed Kisto, and he lived up in the mountains has a beautiful ranch, and he always used to say, "Oh, it's a beautiful day, a beautiful day." When I see him in the morning, and I always kind of looked around. I said, oh, what, "What do you mean?" And as I got older, then I realized what he means. He said, "To be glad that every day you're alive, that you get to see people, you get to see your relatives, you get to, to talk, think about our ancestors." And get to see our grandkids, you know, and that's so though that's the important people, our grandkids and your grandkids, to talk to them about the him uh, our way of life. And uh, and, uh, and you'll hear the archaeologists, uh, their side of the, the story, but we are always going to believe in our him and who we are and what we what we are what we're all about. But um, like I said, about the whole conflict our ancestors. And when we do the reburial, you know, that's how I get to meet them. And I think of them, how they had survived hundreds of years, uh, Hilla River and all over. And uh, we see the remains of uh, what they had, uh, what they used, the plants and the animals and uh, the rocks, the same thing that we, we used to use down, my grandfolks used, and some of them still use today. And, um, uh, one of the things I also kind of went to, uh, really kind of got to me is that one time there was a uh, uh, Highway 86 going to a reservation. This, um, they were doing an excavation and they came across a place where they were crema doing cremation, the whole And uh, it, it, it didn't bother me. And I went and I learned from this um, old, um, this uh, old person archeologist. And he told me, this is what you were gonna see. And sure enough, I got to see it. I got my hands on it. I touched it. And then later on, I realized that, you know, that um, um, I should have had a blessing. I should have had a fan, a feather to cleanse myself and protect myself to that this, that my ancestors won't bother me as when I finished uh, the helping with the survey. And, and I, I, it was so interesting to me, but I, I I respect it, but I also respect the, my, my ancestors, the whole that they need to be put back in the ground. And when our belief is that they're supposed to be not removed and it's not their fault and they should have been left alone, but there was a new road coming to it's gonna be affected. And so we removed them. So today I, we also, Samuel and me, we go to Tucson all over and we do a blessing of the sites when they before they excavated by law under NACPA and put the do the uh, uh, what do you call it the treatment treatment plant that every construction on highway highway or anywhere 
has to be approved by the tribe and look at that, what comments that we have. And we go there and we do a blessing. But uh, I just want to share, for, you know, like what I tell them when I talk to them in my own language all the time and tell them, you know, it's not their fault that, they, that, that they're being removed. It's this other culture and, um, and they don't understand who we are and what we have and don't bother them. Just go along, but in the end, it will get, get you back to our reburial, which is going to happen in, in one more week, and we'll put them back in the ground. And they'll be there forever. And that's where our ancestors are, uh, other Hokum are there. And so, and, uh, and I was talked to that by another Maka and told me, talk to them and tell them that Joe walked in with another one. Told me, talk to them and tell them what you're doing. And over time, I used to not invite the the people that are doing the excavation, then one day, I don't know why, and I thought, well, you know what? I need to educate these young archaeologists that are just now beginning to learn and tell them, come on, let's go. You know, come here, don't walk away. Come here, I'm going to come tell you what I said, you know, and what, what, what they're, why, why they're being moved. And, they, and a lot of them understood it and they respect it. So, you know, talking to people, the other culture, which they need to hear our side of the story and respect our side of the stories of who we are, where we came from, and the uh, Hohoka that are our, our ancestors. We published the same way with other tribes too, that were fighting for those uh, to uh, let the other, other people, in, even in college, in school. And the best time is one way is that when their kids are small, you start teaching them that the autumn language your language, what, whatever tribe you are, they start teaching the kids and they'll, they'll learn, but they also need to learn the other side. My good friend, Joe Joaquin, before he passed on, he always said, there's two roads and you have to follow those roads. You can walk, but you walk on one side and then you move back on the other side and you move back on the other side. But it's really up to you how you want to follow that, that road. But as autumn, it's a, it's a hard task in, uh, and I got to see that. And he would talk to me about other situations that, that he had to do. That it was a hard call, but he said, I stuck to this. We all have to stick to our, our identity, who we are, our, our human duck, and share it on with other people. And when I had the opportunity, I, I'll, I'll, um, I'll do that in a crowd, and my own people, the kids. And when I was doing biology, I, was, I, was, I went to the schools and I talked to the kids. But I went down to their level and I act like a kid. And, I, and I, they were really fun. Ah, oh, they had a lot of questions. Mr. Francisco, what's this? How come they're sharp? How come they have no mistake? It was just so, you know, that I knew that they didn't, you know, they, they needed that guidance and that you have to tell them that's part of education. And always telling them, yeah. And that you're awesome, you know, yeah, you have to talk about them, you know. But, and it, it was fun. I, I like talking to kids too. They, they, they're, they're really not knowledgeable, but they have to learn from us. If the parents aren't teaching them, or like the grand folks are gone, somebody has to educate them. And, uh, and, uh, and it's time for other people like, like, like me. I used to have black hair, now look at it. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I have to, um, it's just part of my work. And I think after I leave my work here, uh, when I retire, if I ever retire, I'm still going to share what knowledge I have to other people and encourage me. And one of the other things that I learned was that um, a lot of the young people that went to school and they got their degree, they went into their field, but they would say, you know what? I wanted to go into archaeology. And I knew why they didn't go in there because the, my grand folks told me, don't bother them, don't touch them, don't take them, respect them. It was really strong to them, and so that's what they did. And I told them, you know what? You can still do archaeologists. You just got to respect it, and you got to you got to uh, protect yourself. Sometimes there's stuff there that uh, that uh, is going to affect you, and it's going to and it's going to harm you. And uh, you need to protect yourself. And they don't know, so we have to tell them about the medicine men, who they are, and what they're going to do, how they're going to help. And the medicine man tells me there's a lot of youth that are getting affected by, by playing the Ouija board, other stuff that's not good and that they need to uh, do away with it. And, 
and uh, go see the medicine man. Medicine man about that, and they would get um, okay again. And um, and the other part is, you know, I'm pretty sure somebody's going to ask him, "Well, how come you're doing a lot of this? It's not affecting you, and that you are, you know, you're still you're still at it." And uh, when I try to talk to people about uh, re re reburial, about uh, about uh, what we deal, we had old remains, uh, our ancestors, they don't want to hear about it, and they're scared. They're scared that, that it's going to affect them. They're scared that they don't want to do it. And I said, there's our ancestors. There's some, and I, one time I went to a monitoring, uh, monitoring session and I talked to the crowd. There's quite a lot of men and women. And one of the things that I pointed out was, hey, um, I want to share with this in, about what I learned and what I see and what I've done. But I want to tell you before I start, some of you here are not, are, are, are here because of a job, but if you don't want to handle remains, this job's not for you. You need to you need to listen to it, and then you need to move on because you're you're in my in the work that you do. You need to deal with human remains. You need to deal with the skeleton. You need to see them. You don't have to touch them, but most likely you have to remove them. And there's some parts that are negative, and you got to protect yourself too. And I see, and I tell them that. that that after the session, this young man came up and he said, you know, uh, thanks for telling me that because I don't want to do it. Okay, well, it, it, it's, I'm just telling, sharing that with you. So it's good to do, you know, find something else. You know, there's a lot of other stuff to do, but you know, you know, you, you, you shouldn't be forced to do it. You know? So, and in our job as a, a, a cultural resource specialist, me and Samuel Fayon, is that, um, we do home site clearance. And the reason is that through NAGPRA, they have to do a, 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 a um, archeological clearance and also do a biological clearance too. But in the archeological clearance, we go out and we survey the site. They wanna put a home site, um, a pasture, waterline, whatever else. And there are some villages that have who come sites under the community at that time, the community didn't know when they were relocated that there was that, that, that the remains were underneath them. Um, an old village, um, there's about, well, about five villages that we know that every time they're going to do some kind of work, we request in their, in, their, in their clearance letter that they have a monitor from our program. And Sammy Army will go out and we'll monitor the project when they start digging. And if anything comes up, we collect it and get a, uh, do a, we have to do a blessing. And then uh, our archeologist, Mr. Peter Steer will come and retrieve and we'll bring it back to, or even the consultant company that was doing the survey will retrieve it, but we do the blessing and then they will take it. But in the end, we'll get them back to, to NAGPRA, uh, the law that, yeah, that, and they wanted, and I get another thing that I hear from them is that they want to do the right thing and retrieve it back to the tribes. And that's how we get a lot. And as the, in the nature, when I've been here, we've been getting a lot of a uh, lot of remains turned back to us. And next year we'll have more remains. And, and but I was told eventually we'll fade out because we're getting a lot of the, uh, museums and colleges that are giving us the, our remains back and get them off the shelf and give them back to us too, which is really good, you know. So, but um, but. So now I'm going to move on, and uh, but that's my point on um, who will come, our ancestors, and um, I don't think nobody can can change my mind, and I think a lot of the elderly people out there uh, don't want us to bother the the, the the ancestors in the ground. Their way of thinking is they were there to stay, and we shouldn't be bothering them. But um, when and when we do surveys with Samuel, we look at the land. And we find things like scattered pot shirt, plain well, decorated, whatever, obsidian, everything. That's an arc site. So we tell the homeowner, you need to move from here, move somewhere else. This is not a good place. It's an old site. And we don't know what's underneath. And a lot of the young people don't understand it. Why? Why? Then it tells you, you they're not, they're not, um, uh, they haven't been never told about uh, our ancestors and that you need to protect those by leaving them alone. And so, and, and some of them, a lot of them will change. He said, okay, 
I'll move you over here. I'm not gonna say no, but we're gonna move you over here and uh, we'll survey that and that's a good site. And they'll go forward from there too. And sometimes we'll find, find, uh, find mounds and those, we don't know what's underneath. And uh, there's, sometimes there's taboo there. And some people don't listen and they build on there. And then it affects the kids. The kids see things that we don't see, that we don't see as adults. And it scares them, it gets them sick. So they have to get a medicine man to come and look at, look at the home site or look wherever the child is and tell them there's something that's in the house that he can see. And I believe strongly is that when babies are, when babies are born at about four or five years old, they see things that we don't see. Uh, my, years later, my, my son finally told me that they used to see a person sitting on, on, the, on the bed. And, I, and the first thing that comes to my mind was my father. And I think he wanted to see him, you know, uh, because he was, my father died at 42. And, uh, and, um, and I tell him, don't be scared of him. If you ever see him again, that's your grandfather. He just wants to see you and uh, he misses you. And if it's a lady, it's gonna be your grandmother, my, my mother. And they just wanna see you because they, they're gone and by then you, and you were born. And so uh, getting back to the homeowner, so they agree, so okay, move on. And, um, uh, but everywhere they're, they're on the nation, there's always things to find when we, when we start, when they start digging power lines, um, water lines, um, building homes, there's always something in certain areas. And, uh, and, uh, and I wonder, you know, you know, and I know that they've been there for a long time and they need to be protected and left alone. And sometimes you can't, you can't, uh, you can't move, stop the project, but so whatever we have to monitor and whatever comes up, then we'll, we'll retrieve it. And um, other people that I've met, my, 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 my cousins, they've seen a lot of stuff and they would talk to me about it. A lot of them, is, um, some of the stuff is eroding due to the erosion of the soil. And so they, they, end, they end up, uh, and they don't know what to do with it. And you go and the, the cremation vessels, they'll break and they'll go down the wash and get scattered again. And people have told me that they've seen inhumations, but they won't tell me. And they, they said, it's gonna go back. And I have to respect what they're talking about. Yeah, okay, that's, that's okay, you know, it's okay. It's, it's gonna go back anyway. So, so in our, about our ancestors, that's what I wanted to cover about that. I, um, there's probably a lot of uh, some of you people that are uh, viewing today might be curious about that, you know, about uh, have more questions about that and, and about what uh, what I thought about um, our ancestors who will come and, uh, and uh, that's who we are and that's who we're always going to be and um, which is uh, good, it's good. And I share with my brothers and sisters, you know, we all. There's other people that are well familiar more about the laws and, and about some other elder people know about location sites like that. And I have a friend that lives in another village, an older gentleman, uh, his name's Jose Enriquez, and he's a good friend of mine and we did surveys and he talked about all over that he wandered off and he saw a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff out there. He said, you won't believe what I saw. I said, well, it probably happened. He said, yeah, and I just, question and he would ask me, how come this is like that? And I said, well, from the outside world, this is what they tell me and that's what it is. And he said, okay. But from the autumn side, that information was not shared with us. And so we forget, we don't know that. So the only thing we have is the archeologists telling us what they think that's what it is. And sometimes they'll ask me, what do you think this is? And I said, I don't know. I might know it, some, I might know it, but I don't think I can share that with them because they probably won't understand it, which is fine. You know, it's, it's fine. And, and they, but there's a lot of stuff that we have on the, out here on the reservation. And now I kind of want to move into um, secret sites. Uh, we have a lot, we have secret sites here and, uh, and those people don't want to share that information. And I said, that's okay. You don't have to tell me, but share with somebody in your relatives. So that information will be shared, will carry on to where that location is. And so nobody would bother it. 
Sometimes they would tell me they'll take me over there as a shrine. Uh, uh, a ikata, um, yakata, and they would have it there. Uh, pictographs, uh, drawings, all kind of stuff. And, and to me, those are sacred sites. They're important to us, important to our, our himadak, our culture. Himadak to really keep that keeps us on, keep tracks of uh, who we are and where we're going and what what we're about and reminds us the hooka, hooka. And before the hooka, all the other people that came way before us, they yeah, were talking about the Clovis people, uh, Paloes, that we, we, that's probably where our descent, they're probably our relatives back in the Ice Age back then. But the stories there, we, we, we somehow we lost that information and we don't know how that ties in. Only when we get to the next world and we'll find out what what that's all about, which is just fine, which is fine. And I look forward for that. Maybe, maybe that's the only way some of the, some of the questions that we all have or I have that we'll find out. But today we, we don't know, uh, we, we don't know those answers. But again, back to the taboos. Some of these sites have taboo and we, 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 we don't want people to be bothered. Like I said, what kind of effect it is. And neither leave those things alone. So when you're walking along a, a trail and you see a feather, don't take it, leave it there. Sometimes there are bad people that set these traps and then they get to your family or your children that are not strong and you get some sick. You see a rock, beautiful rock, don't take it, leave it there and just leave, move it off the trail and leave it there. Um, you see other stuff, don't take them, just leave it there because I've been there and I've seen a lot of this stuff on the ground, and it takes me back to my mother. She was always saying, leave it alone, don't bother it, it's, it's not good. So that stuck to my mind ever since, and so I do that. Yes, I do have to touch artifacts, but it'll be bad, and I leave it, and I don't take it. I, I look at it and take notes about it, and, and that's it, and just leave it there, or you move it out of the way if it's in a construction area, or or, or, or uh, go hide somewhere else or buried underground. But there's stuff that, you know, though, that don't need to be shared. Nobody else needs to know. Uh, it's taboo, it's not good. So we need to leave those things alone. That's one of the other important things that I wanted to share with the, with the audience was about that, you know, respect of what we're, who we are and what we're about and what I'm telling you, that's my version to leave this stuff alone. And I, I know everybody else is curious, but it, it's, it's okay to be curious, but uh, respect our answers and respect of what we're, what we're about. And that we've been there and we've been taught about a lot of this stuff. And that's how we know about it. So about the whole come, that's, uh, that's about all I have. If you have any more questions down after this, but that's all I have on the list. And, um, and, uh, Else. But oh, getting direct, I forgot about the NAGPRA uh, and other laws. In NAGPRA, if you use federal monies, Indian Health Service, BIA, you have to follow NAGPRA laws um, and, 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 and just follow them to process and get a hold of the tribes. And that's the law that's helping us as well, too. Here on our reservation, we are not doing any excavation. Um, we, we're, we, we just leave it alone. We just respect it. We just, we'll move the project, tell the contractor to move the project somewhere else, move it or avoid that site. In a lot of my clearance letter, I write those to the family, to the homeowner that's gonna be a homeowner. You need to avoid this site. You need to move it somewhere else and, and they'll do it. And, uh, because it's awesome and they'll understand it. Okay, I, I didn't know that's what was there, they'll say that. So he said, okay, just, he said, well, how do you know this now? Well, I don't, I don't know what's there, but just from the safe side, taboo, just leave it alone. Let's move it and move, go on from there. You don't need to be digging up and trying to find anything because something might happen to you or your children. And so you need to leave that stuff alone too. So that's, uh, that's what I, one of the main things I want to share with you too. So that's um, kind of all the stuff that I want talk to, but if um, I think I'm at that point, if you have any more questions or anything, 
or want to share or something like that too. So you can, uh, I don't know if we have the right time. Is there anything um, else? I have 8.13. Right? Is that what you have? Was, yeah, that's correct. <laughs> so we are out for questions. How? I will go through them um, in the order that they came in, <laughs> in the Q&A to start off with. That's okay. where it got populated first. Um, uh, from Mark Severson. Jeffrey, I have always wondered if Goxmuk is the same as Tapawa or if they are different places. If the Goxmuk is Tapawa? How? He's wondering if they're the same place or if they're different. Yes. Um, uh, Tupawa is called, um, um, sorry, I got, uh, it was a game that they were playing and the Mexicans, the Spanish came along and they saw it's like a marble skin and they called it, uh, that was a, uh, uh, it was another name, that name that you're talking about and, and, and it's Tupawa the location, but Goxmuk, is about us. There's two sites here about a dog being burned. We don't know the full stories about that, but that's the same. Oh, that's awful. Wow, oh, I didn't know wow. that. I heard of the Topao when people came into Topao, they saw these farmers picking bao and oh, yeah. they're like, where are we at? And they didn't yeah. understand this. And they yeah. thought they were asking, what are you doing? Or what do you have? And they so showed them Stuapau. Stuapau. So they started calling it Stuapau. Oh, it must be meaning Stuapau or something. <laughs> yeah, they were calling the game Bawi, the game with mm. marbles. And they thought they were saying that that's how that came about. Okay. I see. Thank you, Mayu. Oh, <laughs> <Tapo. laughs> um, Carol Tellis. Sorry if I'm saying your last name wrong. Uh, Carol asked, do you speak the native language your grandparents spoke to you? And have you taught your children and your grandchildren your native language? Yes, I, I do. Um, I, I really not really, I'm really, some people say I'm really fluent, but when you come to numbers now, I'm, that's, I, it's a certain language. But when I went into service, I forgot my language. So when I came back, I didn't know the language. So I had to kind of like learn a lot of it all over and I brought it back and I said, oh, okay. Yes, I try to teach my nephews and nieces and my grandson the language. And that's, that's very important. When you go to TOCC college, it's one of the requirements that you have to take autumn language and autumn mm -hmm. history. It's, mm -hmm. it's good, but it's better to start teaching the kids when they're small and they'll understand. They won't understand it, but as they get older, then you know, oh, okay, you know. Uh, it's fluent, but they'll learn. They'll learn. Uh, especially, oh, yeah, you're talking to them all the time. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Pamela says, Jeffer, there has, uh, there's been excavation going on north of Ina along the east side of Silver Bell. It's shielded with the tan cloth, but when the wind blows, you can see work going on there. Are you part of that study and are you able to claim things they find and take the things back to the reservation? What types of things are they finding? So maybe just focus on the first part. There's several, um, two questions here. Are you part of the study? Oh, several. Are you part of the study and are you able to claim the things they find? Yes, we're aware of that. Like I said, that P that's Pima County. They're widening the road on the west side of the river, and they're they have to follow the laws. And they have a treatment plan. A treatment plan tells you what you're going to do when you start excavating. What you're going to find. You have to identify all that. And they have been re recovered. We have received uh, a lot of the human remains, uh, cremation and inhumation along that route, and that and um, and we're getting that back. Some of them we're getting back. Uh, last week, and uh, that's going to be reburied. And yes, we are aware Pima County is really for um, archaeological. They support it. They understand our side, and, and we're always involved. And we have a lot of monitors that are coming out of uh, Senevier District. They have a monitor every two years. They have a monitor training class, and they're sent out there, and they're hired by the company, which 
they have to hire them. And so they're on the job and they always see something. Samuel's been involved, I've been involved, off and on like that. But they let us know. They'll give Peter Steer a call and let him know about it. Yes, we are aware of it. Mm-hmm. Awful. Well, um, have you, uh, Stephen says, have you seen any kind of movement among the youth for a desire to return to and preserve traditions of their ancestors? Um, yes. Yes, it is, especially in the school. Uh, uh, some of the schools, uh, uh, like, like down the road, that they are um, getting a cultural uh, a teacher to teach about culture. There's a young man out of Santa Vera, his last name is Ines, and he's really good at that. And he has a class on that. And he also talks about language, cultural. And sometimes they used to invite us, go walking, go, I would go. And then lately they haven't been really uh, inviting us a lot because it's more, they're trying to more, uh, more um, um, the study, the work that they need is pushed and it's kind of cultural stuff is on the side, but they're still mm-hmm. aware of it. And I, um, like I had said, some of the kids are, are kind of going uh, into the other direction, but they eventually will come back and they'll ask, start asking questions is to get preparing who would, uh, they have children, the kids are going to school and they'll come because teachers at school learn about this word and then they ask their parents, what's this version? And the parents don't know because they weren't, they kind of left the language in the culture. But eventually they'll learn learn again. When you mm-hmm. just gotta meet with the right people, um, and talk to them and have guidance from them. Mm-hmm. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Maria wrote, what is the significance of the Hilla River in your culture? Hilla River is our aunts, is our cousins. The, the autumn nation starts, the autumn people land is originally, our ancestor is from the Salt River all the way down to into Mexico where the, where the Yaquis, there's a river and the Yaquis lived on the other side and that was the end of our southern boundary and our northern boundary. And our western boundary was the river, uh, Colorado River, and you go east to Benson. Benson, the San Pedro River was the end of our other one. So in Salt River, you have the Akame Autumn, the, the, in the north, in the eastern part is the Stripery. And then if you go down in Mexico, we have the Autumn in Mexico, but there's another tribe that are Autumn, they're isolated up in the mountains. And uh, Op- Opcom, and there's Opa-tum. something there. And they're still to there today. And then we have the western, the western part of the, of the reservation, and that was the Yashkarata. And today they, they, their land used to be the Ghani Range and over in Yuma, but they were moved off the red, off the land and then all in Aho or in different areas. But those were our ancestral land, and over time it's been cut here and here to where we are today. But the four tribes, there's Akmer Autumn, there's uh, Hilla River, Salt River, and Tio Nation. The four tribes that we meet every month, talk about issues, invite other archaeologists, people um, want to know stuff about what's going on or tell them about projects. Like that. So, okay. Okay. Um, Jeffrey wrote, uh, what is what, uh, excuse me, was, was there a particular burial practice used by the Hohokam? For instance, were burials above ground or a mound? You mentioned uh, cremation, Whoa. Yeah. Oh. Yes, um, there was, according to archaeologists, there was a part-time of cremations, but it was only a really short time, I think, in the 14th century, and it didn't last that long, and then it faded out. And then became inhumation. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with the Spanish of the way they buried them, the ceremony, all that, that which we do today, the rosary. See all that mm-hmm. stuff that we do, the crosses and all that. Back then, um, remember there was a virus, the black vomit. It was a, 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 a what was it? Um, um, it was that uh, uh, anybody came and covered all over it really hit a lot of the autumn and there was villages that were wiped out 
it was a virus, but it was called back varmint in the late 1800s, I think. But it came from Mexico, the way I was told. And a lot of people were just thinking they were dying. They were just taken out and there was a small, uh, in, uh, in the, uh, digging in the ground and they were buried. And my cousin was saying that her father was telling that's the way they were buried at a fast rate. And a lot, a lot, it cut down a lot of our people. It's kind of like the virus today, which is happening as well too. It's killing a lot of the, our elderly and it, it's not good, but we can't change it. We can get shots, but back then there was no shots. There was no hospital and uh, the weak people, the, uh, the elderly were the ones that were getting affected. So today it's, it's, uh, it's a whole lot different now back then. Yeah, similarly to our, our burial, our ceremonial practice, this in contemporary times, or, you know, we have a four day thing and now it's yeah. um, very, very short. And at the middle of the night, you know, it's changed everybody's behaviors, this yeah. pandemic. And the other thing about today, that's uh, my brother and other people that want to do cremation, but they're saying, oh, that's not our way. Yes, it is, because the whole come. Our ancestors were doing that. It faded out. So, you know, mm -hmm. you can do that. And I have a, my friend that was talking about Peter Ruiz. He got cremated. And that's, mm -hmm. that was his wishes. And so mm -hmm. and so I respect that. You know, we have to respect both of them. Both uh, in mission and, and cremation. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then I think we're on our last question. Joanne asked, how do you feel about non autumn folks learning autumn place names and language to try to speak more in harmony with the land? Mm, I think that's good. It's good because then you now respect our side of the, of the Native Americans of how we feel, who we are and where we're coming from and respect returning our remains. And that um, is good. Another thing that I'm seeing, kind of seeing now is that a lot of the uh, non-autumn people are using our medicine man because they're starting to be, understand how important he is to us and how he tells us things that get us sick and that we need him and he will tell us what we have to do. And, and I see some of them that are, that are asking for autumn mama, a medicine man. Mm -hmm. Even in other tribes, they're using our autumn medicine man to go and uh, work or fix them up. And, uh, and they will go, they will travel to Navajo, Hopi, other places and to help people. That's his job, is to help, not just autumn, but anybody that asks for help. And he, that person that's asking that question, which is good, I, I respect it. You know, you can learn the language, it's good. But, uh, 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 there's, and the dialogue will change in different areas. Depends on where you go, like I'm from here, to power and I'll go to the Hickey one and they kind of laugh at me because my the way I say things. But we but, but we can try we can talk. It's just that they talk yes. faster over there than over here. Then go further to center where they're slower. But here is is this the way I'm gonna be and you can't change me of the way I see words, certain words, mm -hmm. you know. That's right. That's good, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um I'm looking in the chat and uh, it's just, um, um, there was a hand that was raised. I don't know if um, Sonia still had a question. Um, yeah, there's, there's also a question from Frank Grenier in the chat just before oh, okay. my message to Sonia. All right. Oh. About halfway down. Your message to some, yeah. Do you, if you see, um, I see your thanks to Jefford. Um, Ron, no, go, go above that, uh, Megan. There's a message from Frank Grenier. Do you see any areas where archaeologists and odds can agree on the interpretation of the Hohokam people? Mm. Did you did, did he hear you? Go ahead and repeat. Uh, Frank asked, do you see any areas where the archaeologists and all of them can agree on the interpretation of the Hohokam people? Um, 
Yes, yes, I'm starting to see that that they are fine. Not everybody, but I think they're finally understanding that we are the same. But like I had, you know, I had mentioned to you in in your culture, you uh, you separate things, you put them in category here and here to where we don't. It's all one thing. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we're all awesome on the on our nation. It's just that the dialects change. In the location, Akmer uh, 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 Salt River, the, the Sarai Creek, which are gone, but uh, Yashkar Autumn, they're still strong. And so, it, but we're all autumn and we're all trying to do the same thing is to uh, keep the culture going, keep the knowledge going about who we are and where we're coming from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, Jeffrey, a couple more questions, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, re in regards to Holcomb cremations, do you think the Holcomb might have been influenced by the Padian or ancient U human? Patayan. Patayan, sorry. Patayan. Um, the way I understand, the Patayan are mostly by the uh, Colorado River. The pot, the pot, the pot type of pot comes from the, from from there, but we also traded a lot. There's places where we find Patayan uh, 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 pushers, but it didn't. We know that we traded, but the archaeological archaeologists think you no, know, it's the autumns. Yeah, but we traded. We bought it. We traded with something, and that was something that I think they're kind of like struggling right there. But the mm -hmm. Patayan, I, I, the way I understand it, they're mostly on the Colorado. Hiachka and Autumn deal with them a lot. You know, it, it's kind of, it's real interesting knowing where um, where where you're at and who was there. The archaeologists tell you this is who was there. They break it down. And it's, 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 I can only really believe in my culture, what I am. That's a whole nother thing. If you go to um, 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 uh, Yuma, They'll talk about who they are, where they came from, and that we did mm -hmm. trade and we did mingle once in a while, overlap here and here. But the other one was the Apaches. They were mostly always raiding us, attacking us, killing us, taking the, the children and the women. And um, it, throughout history, it's always, it's always been like that. But then mm -hmm. we go to Mexico, then we get influence from the Spanish. So they learn Spanish. And mm -hmm. so it depends on where you go. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, I agree that um, wherever you go, there you are, you're autumn. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and that we strongly believe in who we are, and that that um, there there was that that uh, connectedness through trading and maybe even knowing which direction to go in, <laughs> but. Yeah. You know, we're we're we are autumn and that's who we've always been. So yeah. um I agree with you. <laughs> um well, Stephen wrote this leads to a question I wanted to ask. Is there any remedy for a non-autumn person who encounters remains or taboo objects and wishes to cleanse themselves? Mm. If they if they really believe in cleansiness, they can talk to an, uh, trying to get a number for a medicine man, or the medicine man, and then he can do the cleansiness. And another thing is that for myself, uh, what I wanted to share with you guys is that you said, I'm a twin and being a twin, my sister's uh, 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 my twin in, our belief is that we are, we automatically supposed to go in the direction of a medicine man. And that we have, we're gonna have that power as now or either down the road or some kind of in that direction. So for me, going to these sites that I see that protects me and of, of whatever is at that place. But it, other people will get affected, might get affected but like for me, handling cremation, the bones like that, that we find or things like that, 
that is protecting me because I'm a twin. It's called mm -hmm. a quadi. And quakati are like two. We can be boy and boy or girl and girl, but I have a twin sister. And and we today I, I have feathers. And just recently I have a, a cousin of mine that gave me more of the cultural, some other cultural stuff that was passed on from here, her father. And uh, and she's she's uh, she wants to find new homes for them. And so uh, she gave me some of the other stuff that I didn't know what it's about. And I started looking into it more, talking to other people that tell me, oh, that's what that is. You need to protect it, you need to take it. And that's just another instrument for me of where, where am I going? Where am I headed? Where, what's, what, what's, going, what's happening to me? Now, if you don't want to become a medicine man, there's another ceremony that can be done to undo that. But by general, you're going to go in that direction and you can't avoid it. Um, I remember my grandmother was always saying, she had a name for me, and she always said, come over here and grab my hand. You're a maka, you're supposed to do it. You know, so like, Dakamu robbed me, and she'll feel about better. And I never knew, you know, didn't understand a lot of it. So I was, then I was finally told, oh, okay, that's why she was doing that too. too. And then I, um, but before like I do the blessing, I think that's part of the, my uh, my path to in that direction is to do that, and and we have to use that power in the right way. We can't use it not in the bad way. Yes, you can, but it's really up to the individual. But the bad, the right way is to do the the right thing and take care of people, help them on their um, in their health. Um, people talk to me, ask me, and a lot of it's just really talking about what I learned. I don't have the answer, but I eventually will find out. And sometimes times they just want to talk. It's nobody should talk about autumn, the language, uh, where they're from, what's going on, you know, what they miss, the food, uh, stories, the ceremonies, which is very cut down a lot of it, that we, mm -hmm. don't, we don't practice that. But that is still going on. We're just struggling along. But somehow it's gonna. It's, I think you'll get stronger again down the road. We gotta have the right people in this to to, to move on in that in that direction, and make it stronger again. And it's really up to our leaders of what direction. But then we also have our own roles too. And I tell that, uh, some of the people that are my age, you say you're an elderly now. You need to play that role. You need to help people. You need to talk to them about the culture. You need to show them what you know. And tell them to respect this, to respect the, what you can see on the ground. Don't touch that. And it goes all the way back to my mother, my grand folks that told us that. And so that sticks in my mind about the young girls, the young people that wanted to go into archaeology because now they do only because they were told not to not to do that. And I told them, you can you can go ahead and do it. It's just you, you gotta say that you're what you're doing, tell them, talk to them. And then they'll, you know, uh, they won't bother you and have respect for them as well. Mm -hmm. but that's the, one of the things. But that's one of the, about what I just told you is that uh, I, uh, uh, who I am, what I am, where I'm going and what I'm doing today. And I have, I have a feather on my desk in uh, crystals and uh, beginning to learn a lot about this stuff. What's, what's, mm -hmm. what's it all about? At that, this age now, I'm still learning. I think we all go through that. Megan, uh, Martina has her tribe, everybody. Al has his tribe and everybody. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's my point on that. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Um, one more. Jeffrey Fisher, he wrote, when did the practice of cremation begin? And uh, was there a concern for the journey to the afterlife life because of it? Mm, of what I read about the, uh, cre uh, cremation, the cremation about the whole um, is what the archaeologists tell me about, I think it was in the 14th century, 1400s when they were doing that. But they said, uh, Peter Sears said it ended, it was for a short time and then it ended. Then they moved into inhumation. And then the, the, like the Yuma people, they still do cremation. They still practice that because that's their belief. Now going into the other world, that's a whole different thing of what, what that's the other side that I don't understand it. 
and I don't know if I'm if I'm if I can go and learn about that. That's not my culture, and of our own people. I don't know if I'm if, if that's my directions or if that's anybody's direction. Sometimes if you don't understand it, don't try to go after it. And if it's meant for you, you'll 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 pick it. You'll come to you in a dream or different things like that. But other people think, oh, you know, I saw an owl, it's taboo. Well, I was just trying to send, send you, tell you something, he's a messenger. Oh, you know what, I heard the coyote was right by the house. Well, he's a messenger, he's telling you something, it's another taboo. So it's, it's not to be scared of it, but just hear it and say, oh, something's gonna happen, believe. And that's what we believe in, that these things that we saw. Oh, I picked up this thing on the on the on the trail. Well, you shouldn't have picked it up because you don't know if it's uh, taboo. There's somebody doing a trick, and if you really want to find out more, you can take it to a market, right? and then he'll tell you if it's good or bad. And if it's not meant for you, you should not bother with it. You should just leave it alone because it can it can hurt you in the long run. Yeah, Jeffrey, could I could I comment um, this from an archaeological perspective? Uh, there's archaeological evidence that cremation began among the Hohokam as early as four or five hundred A.D., and it lasted in in some places up into the thirteen and fourteen hundreds, as Peter said. But it actually started very early. Mm -hmm. Okay, that should be. <laughs> Again, that's an archaeologist. Yeah, there's an archaeologist. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, Hugh uh, wrote, I spend time every weekend on South Mountain and I'm honored to experience the work of your ancestors on the rocks. It is beautiful and powerful and helps me feel connected to the land. Are there ways for a white person like me to learn more about the meanings of some of these works that isn't just from other white people? I think it is. I think you need to respect it. And if it's meant for you, you'll go forward. And I've heard people, um, when I used to go to conferences, they would give me things. There was this lady, I remember one time she was in a conference, she was from Alaska and she came and uh, she met me and she saw me struggling for like one of these shows, but I went, I made it. And she came over and she gave me this little gift. She said, I'm gonna give you a gift, this thing helped me, okay? Uh, about the guy that was on South Mount. Um, it's kind of referring to that. And she gave me this thing and she said, open it up. It was in the pouch, I opened it up. And it was, uh, it was a carving of an owl out of a walrus tusk. And I kind of, chuckle because the owl is a taboo to her. And I had to tell her it's, uh, it's taboo. I know you didn't know it and your intentions was good, but thank you very much. And I will take it, but I'm gonna to have to take it to a medicine. Man. So over time I got back with the medicine man and the medicine man said, this is, uh, this is really good. It's good, this owl, this owl, ivory owl. He said, can you give it to me? And I said, no, it was given to me. <laughs> Then he goes into this story about when he was becoming, before he became a medicine man, he was out in the hot desert. So he went, he was, uh, went under a tree. And as he, as he was standing under the tree, he looked up and there was this big white owl. And that's what reminded him. And that's why he wanted to keep it. And I said, no, he was given to me. And that old gentleman, he was a marker and he passed on already. So to this day, people give me stuff and I have to have them clean. And I've been finding a lot of crystals and crystals are good. Like the gentleman there, yes, you can, you can, you can do that, but you gotta have respect and you can't abuse it. And if it's not meant for you to learn it, you have to just let it go. Don't try to force yourself into going into that. Just leave it alone. Or no, don't do it. You know, it's different from everybody, but for me, it's, it can, if it's gonna help you, like I had told you, the other uh, the white culture is beginning to learn about them, our, our, our spiritual, about our mamakai, how they helped them. And, and, and they're welcome to it as long as they don't, they don't, they respect it and understand it. And if it does not work for them not to go forward and just end it like that. Thank you. 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 Thank
Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm looking at the chat now and uh, I'm down to Al, you shared something. Um, sh can I read it? <laughs> uh, yeah, but after you read mine, Samuel replied. So just go ahead and read his response. Okay. Um, this is Samuel Fayant, Jeffords coworker. When oh, I go ahead and read mine first so, so that people have context. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Jefford. Yeah. This was actively, uh, when I was actively doing archaeology projects on non reservation lands um, that, that's on the Otham claim as their ancestral territory, the late Joe Joaquin and some other Otham elders would come to the archaeological um, sites to perform a blessing ceremony. Joe and these other elders would, uh, would invite and encourage archaeologists to be included. Um, they, sorry, in the blessing ceremonies if they wished. And most of us did participate. Is, is that still the practice today to perform blessing ceremonies at off-reservation archaeological sites and to allow the archaeologists to be included? And Samuel responded um, that when, um, when he would conduct a blessing at Ina and Silverbell, when they discovered the remains, he blessed the archaeologists and protect uh, to protect and cleanse them for the work they are doing. Um, and you know, I think, and if we're all you know working towards that same intention of positivity, this is just my opinion, but if we're all just working towards that same intention for for doing good and to be around good and have a good outcome for the intentions that we have. We do pray for everybody. We do look for the good in all the things that the work is doing. I know, you know, when you see an ambulance, um, I have a friend who said she would pray for the EMTs and the hands of the doctors and the nurses. And, you know, we think about these things because those are things bigger than us. And, and we always have to consider that as, as we all have to share the same earth. You know, we all have to share the same things of life. And um, I think that um, in general, that most of us are, are trying to look towards the good and try to have an open mind about all Atman, all people, not just Dana um, Atam or Akim or Hiachet or, you know, um, Ant. We're just trying to hope for the best and do the right thing as people. And that we always think about non Atam and what they're doing and hope for Hope that they're doing good. Mm -hmm. So that's just my my thought, and um, thank you, Samuel, for uh, responding. And um, that's all the questions I see and and chat responses I have. Any parting words for the night before we let you go, Jeffrey? <laughs> well, I'd like to thank everybody that was involved in this uh, grant, and is. Times like this that is needed, um, it shouldn't end here. It should continue on. And there's more other people that, like me and Samuel that mm -hmm. can be interviewed and carried on uh, and, and so that it can be used. And that's why when they're talking about the get permission about to video and I, and I say, yes, so this can be shared with other people that are out there. Same thing with the Nature Conservancy that I did the videos that I wanted that shared so people can understand the autumn, our culture, our kingdom, and the way we are and the way we live. And that um, I like to thank everybody and bless, like you said, bless everybody. And that's why we pray for before a meeting, we pray after a meeting that we all have a safe trip home and that our families are, uh, are protected and uh, taken care of. And that we pray that the virus will not affect them and, um, and go from there. And I'd like to thank everybody. You too, Megan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So for me then, too. Yeah, Sapo. <laughs> and we'll see you later. <laughs> all right. Yeah, on behalf of Old Pueblo, I'd like to thank you also, Jeffrey. It's a very wonderful presentation you did. Um, Jeffrey has given permission to share this the video of this presentation online. So I will try to get it up on Old Pueblo Archaeology Center's YouTube channel by the end of the week. Thank you.
Do you have any wrap up, Megan? Mm, like Jeffrey, I just want to echo what Jeffrey said. Thank you so much for joining us and everybody be safe and, and get where you need to be safely and sleep well. And um, if you think of us at O Pueblo, you know, come and visit us in our next um, virtual um, Indigenous Interest series and the, the other workshops and educational opportunities that we offer through Al and presenters that are coming through. Um, if you think of it, uh, of donating to these uh, presentations, please, please um, do so for the benefit of educating um, and have a wonderful night. Thank you, everybody.